Hello everybody and welcome to the latest edition of the Royal Blue Podcast. We're going live today on um, YouTube and a, a Good Friday special and I'm your host Chris Beasley, glad to be joined by my Echo um, colleague and Everton correspondent Joe Thomas who's back after a, a well-earned rest, although he was roughly back at, at Finch Farm uh, in at the deep end yesterday. And uh, uh, our regular guest uh, Gavin Buckland, just before I come back to Joe... Um, Gav, um, we, we had a t- um, terrific second um, episode of um, Goodison Park, my home this week. Yeah. Uh, Derek Mountfield in, in this room, he was on fine form. Just as somebody who, who remembers uh, Derek yourself and, the, and those um, glory years, I mean, uh, what was he like? He, he obviously he lived the dream, didn't he, from going from the Gladys Street Terrace to uh, part of Everton's greatest ever side? Somebody's been compared physically to Derek Mountfield before, it has to be said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Derek, yeah, Derek. I mean, it's the type of signing I can't. It doesn't happen now. Derek went from San Mir over to Everton, was playing in the first team within 12 months. You just don't get that now, do you? Yeah. Or very rarely. Yeah, Derek was um, a fine player. I I mean, most famously, I think, his, his goal scoring ratio for a defender was. Was it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable really, for yeah. Everton centre forward. Yeah, two. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> he looked pretty fit on the uh, the video. I think he maybe should play. Yeah, he was he was a, he was very. Uh, I had always an accent. He, he complimented Kevin Ratcliffe very well. I think yeah. he was a bit more physical than Kevin. Was all about pace. Yeah, and um, I think it was made for a good partnership. But he, he was a he was a schoolboy centre forward, wasn't he? Yeah, he was and he, uh, yeah. He, he took that he took that into his into his senior playing days. And he, and a lot, a lot of his goals were in, weren't like classic centre halves. He did score the odd one with you know quite a few, you know headers from crosses and yeah. and dead balls. But some of his finishes were great. You know they were like sort of centre forwards finishes. And uh, yeah, he uh, he certainly lived the dream. And it's always good to have that in tight winning teams. Oh, yeah. and, well, uh, I think local born players who, who support yeah. And he he got a couple of injuries. Um, I think he it was knee was it was cartilage. I think he had problems with he had a couple mm. of operations and it's sa- sadly and it touches on this. It sadly tailed off a little bit and 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 I think you know Howard was forced really to to buy Dave Watson and once Dave Watson came and got settled then Derek who still had injury problems was um, was was you know obviously going to be struggling to get get a game but then he had to go clear Aston Villa. And um, yeah, he's definitely you know. I think anybody play that team. If you played that team all season, then you're an Everton legend for me. Yeah. And Derek, also because he's a local born player and a supporter. Yeah. Um, you know, he adds a little bit extra on on top, and uh, and he's a he's a great fella as well, isn't yeah, he? Oh yeah, he's a he's a he's a lovely guy, Derek as well. No ways and graces about him, and uh, you know, he's one of my favourites. Terrific. Um, before we, we move on to the game and the preview and, uh, and all of that, I mean, unfortunately, the, the noise, as the manager calls it, is always Sergio job with, with ever. And I mean, while you were away, obviously I've been doing that stuff with the FAB. They uh, wrote letters to Farhad Mashiri, to Josh Wanda and to Richard Masters this week. And then they were published uh, the details of those. I must say that uh, um, Triple Seven did get back to them and kind of said, We'll get back to him and say we can't actually say anything hmm. at, at this, this um, period in time. And then there's a, there's a piece from yourself um, today talking about just how Triple Seven are continuing with their, their commitment in terms of the club and, and and the finances, even though we're still waiting for all this to be approved. And that was that was part of the the the, the FAB's concerns of just this this limbo that Everton are in at the moment. Yeah, I think it's an understandable concern, and I think it's probably worth commending the uh, the fan advisory board for some of their work, particularly over the last few weeks. I think they've mm-hmm. judged. A tone of things quite white right and um you know uh, it's a difficult place to be an Everton fan right now yeah. uh, and I think they're doing being as proactive as they can to try and raise the concerns with the right the right concerns with the right people um because it does feel like every week you know, you almost you, know, you wake up on a Monday morning and you you brace yourself for what might come next and yeah, yeah that is going to continue for, for for more weeks to come unfortunately because we know that obviously we know the account's going to come out before the end of the month which is getting very very close and we also know that um you know, we know that the verdict will come in the second PSR case after con- yeah. the case concluded earlier this week, yeah. um, and that's before you even get into the the, yeah, the, the football yeah. in matters because obviously yeah. it's a very very big Easter weekend, and then obviously going into that game against Burnley is is, is going to be huge 
as well. But yeah, no, they raised legitimate concerns, and I think there's a general degree of frustration from across the fan base over this process. There's understandable concern about 777. There's also understandable concern about the length of time this is taken and what that means. I think that they are right, you know, to ask for answers. Like, we have asked for answers yeah. and asked what, you know, for details on the process and what's going on, and you know, the more people that keep asking you know, the, the powers that be those questions, um, the better, I think. And, you know, I, I think that, you, you know, you're right, obviously, I, I wrote um, that 777 have, have come up with their, you know, they've signed off their latest funding package for Everton, so the you know, the, the money for to take Everton through April will be coming from 777, which takes their total commitment to just over $200 million now. Um, obviously, that's a, a huge amount of money, and it's been another addition additional layer to the the length of time it's taken for um, them to get approval yeah. obviously we, you know, we're six seven months in and that additional debt it keeps going up and up and up that everyone are in it's more money that they owe to more people um you know, as they try and survive until a, you know, an outcome is reached but i also think you know it's important to raise it on is a concern with the length of time it's been taken but also still with 777 themselves that's a big point of what the fab are doing you know, they submitted a load of questions to um, 777 back in October yes. just around what their plans are, what their vision for the club, their strategy, the sources um, of, their, of, their, of their finances of their capital and what it is that they intend to do with things like the stadium and they haven't had an answer um, and you know I think you know, asked similar questions at the time and was probably met with a similar answer about 777 believing that they're bound by you know prejudice and confidentiality and not wanting to you know do anything that might impact the the, the, the scrutiny that they're going under from the Premier League but t to be perfectly honest I think that's a lot of nonsense really um, I think that they I think that they they have the capacity and the freedom and the um, the freedom to come out and and explain some of their um, thoughts and their plans and to reassure supporters yeah. over what it is that they're hoping to do. I think that they have that, and I think there are numerous channels like ourselves to be willing to give them a platform yeah. if they were to come out and be a bit more transparent about what they do. You know, it's been a journey of discovery really over the last six months, and it's still true to say that the vast majority of stories around that organisation are still negative. Yeah. Um, you know, we are one of, I imagine, several, but we have constantly knocked on their door and said, you know, what is your plan? And also, you know, you keep pointing to the negative. And I think in one of their releases, they said that there was a lot of perhaps misreporting around them, made that allegation. We've gone to them and said, well, what is the misre misrepresentation? Where are the positive stories? And, you know, the fact that we haven't written any or very few is, yeah. is, is as much down to them as yeah. it is to anybody else. So, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, someone that's kind of spent a lot of time in courts and knows about prejudice and things like that, I don't really see how them coming out and explaining what they plan to do with Everton would prejudice this, this um, process with the Premier League. Indeed, that largely seems to be what the Premier League are asking them themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort a of conversation yeah. that must have been going on for six months anyway. Um, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's poor that 777 haven't been more transparent transparent uh, given the amount of time that's, 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 that's passed and the amount of concern that I think is justified around their potential ownership but that being said yeah. you know obviously you know they are the ones that signed the deal at the moment and um, you know we will still give them a platform yeah. to say you know that platform will always be open to them to, to yeah. try and explain themselves so yeah um, Gav, we've had a, a comment coming in now on uh, YouTube. Uh, Emma EFC says, "Why is it always left to the fan groups to fight for us?" The yeah. silence from the club, as per. Um, what are your thoughts on um, the, the FAB F um, correspondence um, this week? Um, obviously, to the, the, the three uh, um, parties, uh, Mr. Mashiri, Wanda, and uh, Masters. Well, I can't really add to, to what Joe Joe said. I mean, I think we are in limbo. And the worst thing about it is that the two aspects of that that concern me mm -hmm. A is how that affects us on the pitch. Mm -hmm. I know Dice really <coughs> not said a lot about that, but that, that, that surely does. And and B, the longer it goes on, the more parlous our financial position becomes, doesn't it? Because they're lending money to us at quite decent rates of interest. Mm -hmm. Um, which makes our you know our our debts even worse. I know that can be converted to equity if, if they if they took over, but if they don't take over then that's another enormous death that needs paying off by whoever takes over the club. So the long, the longer it goes on, and I don't. We've said on on this forum, you know, we want to get the right decision. Um, that means taking time. I think we've now gone beyond that. Where we're now yeah. in a position where we, you know, we're talking about a funding package as yeah. if we're like some sort of country that's being hit by major floods that need yeah. to you know bailing out by you know the United Nations or something. Yeah. 
we're sort of in that position now, yeah. aren't we? As a football club, which considering the Premier League's riches and Mercedes riches, there I say, it's a it's a ludicrous position to be in, yeah. isn't it? Really, if you think about it, we're like relying on a someone to bail us out on a month to month basis, and uh, I, that that and and some of that I think at the moment is down to the fact that this process has taken so long, mm-hmm. and um, that that it's those two factors, um, and I also agree what Joe said about the fab. I think a lot of the stuff the fabs come out with, not just in this. Uh, around this matter, but also the um, commission. Mm-hmm. In, I, know, I know the commission sort of watered down the, the impact, and, and uh, I, I think a it's greater, greater. I think that they, they take pro- being proactive after some initial cynicism, and b I think that I think the communication has been really clear and well written, and not being at, you know sometimes mm-hmm. some of this stuff can look amateurous, can't you? Can it undermine itself? I think being really well written and well argued pieces, and I think that should be that reflects well on everybody. Uh, but then all that. I think it may have been helpful if the club <laughs> has just said something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think uh, there may be reasons for that, uh, possibly. But uh, uh, some some warming words, I think, from the club may have been may be helpful. But as I say, there, there may be other 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 reasons why they've not said anything. And um, we'll just have to wait and see. But the the, the the two concerns are how it's impacting us on the playing side, and be you know our finances are in a great state before seven seven seven. You mm. know, Took over funding us, and that now that's become far worse. You know, about two hundred million dollars, so that hundred eighty million quid, something like yeah. that. It's a hell of a wedge. I mean, yeah. that's what if you think about it. That's one year's money for us. Mm. Hundred eighty million pound is one year's one year's income. Yeah, you know, and that's a hell, that's a hell of a lot of cash, isn't it? Before you even get the, the green light. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and um, so it, so the longer it goes on, it just it, it might not be the end of it, might it? You know. Yeah. Well, well, sources close to Triple Seven. They, if they felt that you know an end game was coming, they remain confident. They say that a deal will be come, but they just feel that by the end of April it, it will come down one way or the other. Uh, Joe, obviously this week we've not had yourself and G- Gavin. Um, obviously we've uh, had the Nottingham Forest appeal now in terms of uh, their PSR charge, and as we know, Everton have had their um, second. Uh, here in uh, this week, so there's, uh, I mean, that, that, that remains the, the the movable feast. There, we don't know. If, I mean, on a basic level, Forest got um, a smaller points reduction than Everton for for what was a, was a, a bigger charge, but um, they they've said that they're that they're going to appeal that now. So again, that that changes uh, the goalposts again to a certain degree. Yeah, um, yeah. Probably like a lot of people, a little bit surprised that they've appealed, yeah. um, because technically there's a risk that punishment could go up, could go up as a result of that. And I think probably from a lot of this and granted we're seeing this probably more heavily swayed from an Evan perspective. But when you when you look at the judgment that Forrest received and the, and the penalty they received, it, it does feel that they got the best of uh, of uh, you know of, yeah. of, of, of the commissions. It felt like quite a lenient sanction in in the end. Bearing in mind some of the kind of the principles that seem to have been established in the first two Everton commissions, you know, you looked at that Forest one and you thought, I think they've, you know, I, I think both Everton and Forest have legitimate grievances with the mm-hmm. way in which some of their cases have been handled. Yeah. Um, but the, still, the big sticking point for me isn't necessarily over things like size of breach, which I think technically, I think technically Forest got more points for because their breach was bigger. It was just once you went beyond the numbers and looked at aggravating and mitigating circumstances that Evan ended up with a higher total punishment. But there's still a lot that seems at odds with me with the way in which the case has been handled and, and most particularly it's still that the Brennan Johnson thing, this idea that Forrest knew that they were going to be, you know, had been warned about breaching. Yeah. Signed players in January, warned again, you know, didn't 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 take an early an early summer deal for Brennan Johnson. Played it out to the end of the transfer window. And obviously, they got more money financially. You'd say that that makes more sense. But you know, it seems as if it was a very much a kind of a. It has the appearance of a deliberate decision not to comply with the PSR rules. Now, when you look at Everton, even even in the even in the the case where Everton started with ten points, yeah. it wasn't argued that their breach was deliberate or cynical. No. And in the Forest case, where they come down with four, you know, it looks like one. It was deliberate. Like it was a proactive decision made, albeit it sounds like they did that, bearing in mind conversations that they had with with, with the Premier League, and it's just something I've written today that I think an interesting um, 
pattern across the Everton and the Forest cases that both seem to have had a very, very different interpretation over the conversations that they were having with the Premier League leading up to their breach and the Premier League themselves. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably never know what was in those discussions. But it's interesting that both of them have gone down that playbook. They seem to, you know, there, there seems to have been a, a disparity in how they were considering those discussions uh, and how they would therefore be treated when these bre- breaches came to, c- came to a case. Um, but, you know, it seems that uh, you know, Forrest kind of almost had the opposite approach to Everton in terms of how they were breaching. Yeah. Um, but obviously they then had a different approach to the case and they seem to have gotten more credit from that. And that's that's not necessarily unusual, perhaps not to be unexpected. But again, when you look at it, it feels like they've been dealt with quite leniently. Yeah. And one of the reasons for that, the heaviest mitigating factor has been their kind of cooperation, exceptional cooperation yeah. with the Premier League. Yeah. To then come out from that and then issue a <laughs> statement that rallies against the Premier League and then appeal against the Premier League's decision yeah. kind of feels quite counterintuitive. And I think, so, I mean, I have two views on the appeal. On the one hand, I think it's a gamble because I think, bearing in mind that they've had, you know, their, 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 their penalty has been reduced for their cooperation, a starting point for any appeal would be well you're not cooperating now and yeah. therefore you're perhaps undermining that you know that that, that seems yeah. uh, but the second one is that whilst technically it seems that there's a potential for the um, their deduction to be increased yeah. it's quite been quite heavily reported in and around Forest that they've essentially been given a soft signal that they there is no real danger of that happening right yeah. Which, which to me is pretty concerning. Like, look, look, they have every right to appeal, and you know, like I said, I don't think for me this isn't a case of saying Everton got this and therefore Forest got this. You know, what we're trying to do is move towards a process where there's a bit of clarity around it and fairness, and I think both could have legitimate arguments about the way they've been treated. Um, but I think that one of the issues that we've we've got is that who's given them this soft signal, and and, and yeah, this is these are supposed to be processes that are you know, bound by yeah. how many times have we been told that we're not going to be told anything because of confidentiality by both the Premier League, yeah. by both Everton, by, yeah. by Forest and all that. Who's doing this? And So who's doing that? And yeah. secondly, like, who can actually give them any assurances on that yeah. base? Bearing in mind that we've had three expert panels, nine different people approach two different cases yeah. and all come at them from different angles. So who is there that can... Who is there that can yeah. actively judge what the next panel are going to do when Forrest come along and say, oh dear, don't worry, they're not going to increase, whatever happens, they're not going to increase it. Yeah. Where's that signal coming from? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the one thing we learned from the Everton case, the Everton appeal, is the appeal looked at it, the appeal panel looked at it completely differently to the original yeah. commission. Mm-hmm. They, they, were, you know, they, were, they were independent in that, they were operating as if the first commission didn't exist. They were looking at it from their own through their own prison, weren't they? And there's a danger for Forrest, notwithstanding what you're saying, Joe, about some of these leaks or whatever that can be, you know, quite slightly worrying, will look at it completely different and go down the line of some of the points that you've argued there. We argued, I mean, why are we talking about the Flots Forest uh, um, Commission? That they make, they look at like, the, you know, cynical beaching, you know, overspending in January when you knew you are going to beach PSR and, you know, punish them accordingly. So, um, if I was Forrest, I would have just I would have just taken the four points myself. But yeah. you don't know. But they but they they'll argue they've got other other you know some of the stuff about what happens to you when you come up to the Premier League when you've not had the parachute payments. I think and you, you know disadvantages that I do get uh, to a degree. But um, yeah, I was surprised. But we'll have to have to wait and see. But just, we'll just, uh, just see what, what what happens. I mean, just just while we're on a bit a bit of breaking news. Obviously, I think one of the the, uh, the listeners. Um, referred to anything to Everton not really saying anything about this process yeah. and whilst we've been on the the interim CEO um, Colin Chong has issued a statement yeah, on the website hasn't he right, so, okay. um, <laughs> just in relation to 777 um, I'll read out the, the bit in yeah. relation to that he goes to that end we we're approaching the final stages of what has been a comprehensive but long regulatory process to progress a takeover agreed between our majority shareholder Farhad Mashiri and 77 partners 777 partners in the autumn of last year the transaction requires approval from the Premier League, the Football Association and the Financial Conduct Authority in order to proceed. It is a process that has taken longer than any of us anticipated, although certainty over time scales is always a challenge given this is the first such full takeover of a Premier League club since the amendments were made to the regulatory approval process in March 2023. So that's the, yeah. the beefed up owners and directors test and also the introduction of the oversight panel, which will look over whatever the initial decision is made by the, the Premier League board. 
he then goes on to, uh, out of respect for that process and aside from affirmations of a collective commitment to complete the transaction, Mr. Mashiri and 777 Partners have deliberately not provided detailed running commentary during the regulatory review period, and that must remain the case until the process is concluded. But we want to provide an assurance to every Evertonian that communication regarding plans for the future will be shared at the earliest opportunity following the conclusion to that process. Um, so, I mean, he acknowledges that the process has taken a long time, is ongoing, but obviously yeah. the, 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 the search for answers will yeah. continue until I think many of us would argue that it's already to a degree too late if they've already got the green light, 777. Yeah, I'd but. like to think that Colin was watching the stars of this <laughs> Do you reckon, wait broadcast for... where that heard that they need to send yeah, something so. else and has <laughs> sent something else on the yeah. back of it. But no, I mean, I th there's not like. The, the, there's not a lot more, more you can say than that, really. I, think it, I certainly know. think there's not a huge amount more that Everton can, can say, say yeah, absolutely. because they're not really a primary mover in all no. this. This is a, a deal between Farhad Bashiri and 777 that is being overseen by the Premier League. Yeah. You know, Everton are almost like a dormant part of this, aren't they? We, we, or, we're in the middle of that triangle, yeah, aren't we? Exactly. And so, um, I, I know I get, I so get whereas, the like I kind of said earlier, that I think seven, I think there's a lot more that 777 could say. I'm not. I, I don't label the same accusation necessarily at the no. club. I mean, really, if, if they're maintaining um, what you would hope would be a, a suitable degree of distance between themselves, bearing in mind that green light hasn't been given, you, what you wouldn't expect and wouldn't want is for the club to be acting as a spokesperson for seven seven seven. So, no, yeah, they need to fight their own battles themselves. Seven seven seven. Don't do, they? Do you think it might have been better if that sort of statement was sent earlier on in the process? Uh, well, firstly, I think it's probably important to say that's part of a much wider of statement, statement that, that okay, comes yeah. out. It acknowledges okay. the, the the uncertainty around the you know the PSR, the Prophet's Statement, oh, right, okay. acknowledging that the case took place earlier on this week, yeah. um, and also kind of looking at Sean Dyche and what you know what you know, the the need to back the team. I think probably going into this crucial run of fixtures, I think also. Um, saw a line in there about record break and speed of season ticket renewals as well. So it's a much wider thing. I think it's probably the time and it's, you know, it probably makes sense with having had three weeks away from football. So Yeah. No, it's good to see the clubs at least acknowledging yeah. you know, some of the correspondence that's been sent to them and uh, and that's fair play. I just think around that might be a bit more helpful if they said something about the, the takeover area that our hands are tied as a football mm. club. Mm. We can't really do a lot. Um, but yeah, fair play, fair play to Colin. Yeah, so we try and move on to some football now. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, long last, uh, you, you were there, Joe. Uh, this is back in back at the sharp end of things, Finch Farm uh, yesterday. Sean Dyche's uh, pre-match uh, press conference, and uh, of course, obviously, a, n a number of topics was discussed, and it was always going to be the case that he would be asked about a certain incident that went on uh, and the training trip to Portugal. Yeah, um, yeah, he was asked. I wasn't sure if the question was coming or not, but you know, I think um, Video Connor from Sky did the professional approach of um, the t professional tactical approach of asking all the the obvious questions that he needed answers to first, and throwing yeah. that one at the end, so yeah. that if things went sour, then he still got what he needed from it. And, and fair play to it, to him for that. Um, I mean, Dykes tried to laugh off as we kind of expected he would. Um, you know. I think we reported at the time that you know it was a misunderstanding and it's something that I think all parties involved have tried to move on from and accepted that it's a misunderstanding. Um, Gav, I mean, I'd be interested to see your thoughts on, on what he said. He, he <laughs> yeah, play, well, was it a playful stuff that was misinterpreted yeah, or something yeah, like that, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, I kind of... There was almost like a lingering sense of... Um, Bafflement over how things had escalated, given what unfolded, which I was strange. Found it strange that he alluded to. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I sort of a couple of things going on here, isn't it? The first thing is because there's a three three week gap. This sort of stuff is newsworthy, yeah. isn't it? For the start. The second thing I'd say because there's a lot of stuff around Everton at the moment that's negative. If a team's winning games, we're doing really well. This is the type of thing that just doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. You know. It doesn't really have, you know, get get reported as such, but it just fits into the Everton narrative, doesn't it? Really, at the at all this stuff that we're talking about, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's probably it's the profile of it is probably been a lot higher than what Dice would think it should be, and mm, what yeah. I think it should be. Really, it's it's it's. A, I mean, I would imagine I've, that 
thing probably ha- has happened countless times over the years. Disagreements with managers and players. Well, it has happened. I mean, yeah. I've written about it myself. Um, and yeah, it's just part of football, isn't it, really? And I, I thought it was a bit of a nothing story, but it's, I think it's rose to the surface because of the, the, you know, the, the noise, as Sean, Sean Dice would say, around the club and the fact that we are struggling and we are perceived to be a easy target. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, I think that's the that's the reason why the actual incident itself. I wasn't there, so I can't really can't really comment. Just wonder if Nathan Passon plays tomorrow, though. That could be quite an interesting thing, you know. Um, but I, I just thought it was um, it was a, it was a story, but a lot's been made out of it that I think it didn't really deserve. To be honest with you, what do you think, Chris? I, th- I think my my concern would be um, how how we got out. The fact that um, right, okay. and maybe it was a, you know it could have been some diners there and in, in, in the restaurant, yeah. maybe a third party sort of it. Uh, but I'd be more concerned that yeah, that what you know unity in the camp, why these sort of things mess necessarily are slipping out. But I suppose these days, I mean, every, so much isn't it? I mean, we were, um, the, the club were officially you know not revealing where they were, but then and, and the players were on social media all the time posting all kinds anyway and that's yeah. that's the the world the world that we live in there, now. There is there is a historical precedence I think with Everton, which is similar, which is in nineteen ninety when Colin Harvey's last season we knocked one from the start of the season. We had the infamous uh Martin Kill Kevin Sheedy incident in the in the, in the Chinese, it was in the it was in the hotel bar, wasn't it, in Southport and that got out in similar circumstances mm-hmm. to this. And it was all over the newspapers. And one of the things, the context to that is Everton have not won a game all season. Yeah. Colin Harvey's under pressure. This feeds that narrative, you yeah. know. And I think this is a similar type of uh, incident for me. In normal circumstances, it would probably be just brushed under the car. But yeah, if we were mid-table, yeah. But it just fits into the whole narrative. Especially a, pe- a player now, who he's not been picking, either. Yeah, really, yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> the whole narrative around Everton now, in the same way as the the... The incident with Kevin Sheedy and Martin Keown in, in Southport 1990 fitted into the narrative mm. then that that was, a, that was a manager that was struggling and was a club that was struggling. Mm. And these are the type of stories that get out and then get legs on the back of that. Yeah, I'm not too worried about the, the leak, like mm. you, Chris, just in the sense that my understanding is the incident happened in a, what's essentially a public restaurant. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, these kind of, you know, luxury five star, largely you know, well, sports, but largely golf related places, mm. particularly you know Southern Europe in you know, this time of year, they have a probably have quite a select clientele, don't they? And I think that it's probably the type of place where Evan turned up, and you know, you would expect to come across quite a lot of people in the world of football, yeah. and that would include. Yeah, I I know that there were you know significant figures in the world of football that were staying there the week before, for instance. So. I don't think it would be that surprising that, like, if there were, you know, agents or direct, you know, yeah. agents, yeah. directors, all those intermediaries that you get that yeah. kind of float around football, make a lot of money, and like to spend their time, you know, going on golfing holidays when they get a spare time. Ex players, yeah. those type of things. Rather those than type the Everton of group itself, who would one, yeah. Be aware of who that group of Everton players were in a way that, say, the general public might not always have been. Yeah. Uh, and two, have probably more natural links. To newspapers and people like that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, right. So I kind of, I'm willing to yeah. give the squad the benefit of the doubt there. I think because I certainly don't think that it's anything that the parties actually involved yeah. wanted to come out. And I don't think anybody proactively from 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 the actual instance itself sought to put it out there. I kind of my worry is a little bit just it just kind of. I'm not worried about the incident itself. I think, you know, Deitch is forever talking in press conferences mm-hmm. about reporters not getting his jokes when he cracks one during a, you know, during an answer. Um, and, you know, we can, I think it's quite easy to see how misunderstandings can happen. Yeah. Um, I'm probably just a little bit worried about the resilience of the group if things start badly. I mean, we're going to come on to the football now. Yeah. I actually think Everton might get a good result at Bournemouth. But Bournemouth is a tricky game. I mean, it's an absolute hellhole of a place for Everton over the years, isn't it? When you look at oh, the past, yeah, like it really is. You know, there is there is a scenario that things get worse before they get better. And after this three-week break, they go to Bournemouth, difficult side, potentially not win. They go away to Ch- Newcastle, very difficult game, not win. Middle, back end of next week, maybe get a verdict. 
quite possibly points deductions. They end up moving closer to that chasing pack beneath them. Well, the pack beneath them. So it's that pack where I'm not there chasing. But some of those teams, Forest, particularly Burnley, might close a gap on Evan if they were to not get anything from the next two games. Mm. And you end up in a... My, my, just my fear is you just end up in a situation where this time in a week we're looking ahead to that Burnley game and all of a sudden Everton are either in the relegation zone or on the cusp of the relegation zone. The 11 without a win has become 13 and the pressure on that Burnley game becomes huge. Because if, I mean, if Burnley were to win one of their two games and Everton were to get hit with, say, a three-point deduction... Then all of a sudden, Burnley could go into that home that game at Chipper Goodison, thinking that Everton are within their sights, and it could yeah. just completely change the dynamic at the bottom end of the table and of that match. Um, and my my worry is if Everton were to hit a negative trajectory this week, the you know, counts coming out as well. That we end up in a scenario where just if if there is an underlying tension and things could flare again, that that's my only kind of my only kind of worry. I think it would take a lot of bad things to happen yeah. for Everton to end up in a situation where that was to happen. But like it just you just worry just a little bit. The counter to that is Dice has won his last six Premier League games against Bournemouth. Yeah. And uh, well, the, say but Bournemouth at, yeah. Bournemouth and Newcastle at home was were two three nil wins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, Take us back, please. <laughs> so he's won eight pound that they are his favourite Premier League team to face. Yeah. He's won he's won eight out of twelve against them. Um and Bournemouth themselves, although they've they picked up points, haven't they? Conceded about five goals at home to Sheffield United and mm. Newton in the, the last two home games. I'll be to be fair, they've they dragged four points out of that. Those two games. So, the, the, the counter is, is we got to win tomorrow and the results, yeah. you know, go in our favour all of a sudden. You're thinking, well, that's you, you it. know, like you there, think there, actually, there are two ways in which it's could be safe involved, this time next yeah. week. Play could, like, Burnley. That's it. Could, yeah. could, could go and play Burnley at home, get three points, points, and all of a sudden say, you know what, I think, I think, we're think safe. season's over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The points <laughs> well, we've, we've swung down over the last yeah, minute yeah, or so. Like heat, but that's the way it can be. Yeah, that's it. Well, the hearing might not be as bad as some of us might fear. Yeah. You know, and yeah, there is that potential. Yeah. Like we, Everton could be you could know, in eight days, one way or in eight, the other. In eight, in eight, yeah. day, in eight days, Sam Everton could be in the relegation zone. Eight days, Sam Everton could be essentially safe for the season. So, What's probably going to happen is it's going to be a really bitty week <laughs> where they kind of pick up some points, but not as many as they want. But and we just end up kind of no, yeah, <laughs> none well, the wiser. Yeah. But there is the I, I I think the week that will probably define the season is that one where they have three home games in a week now mm. the Forest Liverpool Brentford yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah. this this is quite possibly the most important you know we've got to get there first it's been a week it's been a season of so many important weeks and this week yeah. is probably up there yeah. with a fight for being well, the most but when you take into a, yeah. account the accounts and the probable PSR kind of thing coming out as well yeah Bearing all that in mind, so uh, <laughs> Gav, if I come with Take you first, then. Paul, we've got a comment here on YouTube. Yeah. Paul Galt says, would you say tomorrow's game is a must-win or a must-not-lose game? We, we've discussed that quite a few times this I know, season. I'm not sure we... what I should say. They're all must-win games. They're all important games. Uh, that wasn't an attempt to an impression. I'm sorry, I was... <laughs> was it not? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was, it's, 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 um, I think it might sound like a very bad one. I On this basis, that, that one of the great things in football now, isn't it? One of those is, is, is this thing of looking at blocks of games, isn't blocks. it? Blocks of that's games. Something the go, say. No, it, that's that's overtaken. You know, we take every game as it comes. It's sort of like a cop house, isn't it, for, for this type of question? Uh, so look at these block of three games, isn't it, really? Um, I, I, I would say. I would say must not lose, but on the basis that we've got to take a win then against Burnley, I think. Yeah. And if you said points against Bournemouth, three against Burnley, and I think four, four points, four points that, good, I, I, I'd take that. I, think, I don't think Newcastle is an impossible no, no, result they, either, they, they, but I think... They're mid-table mediocrity, you know, aren't they, a little bit, aren't they? Yeah. I think if Evan were to get four points yeah, this week, I think that would be a positive. Oh yeah, from the two away games, yeah. Oh, the three, the three, okay. And Burnley, yeah, yeah. I mean, Burnley at home is a, is, is a must win. I yeah. think that that is a must win. We yeah. can argue about the other two, um, but yeah. I don't see a scenario in which Burnley at home is a I, must I, win. I, if you if you get a draw tomorrow, I'd be be quite happy with that. But it then puts the pressure on yeah. the Burnley game. I mean. And you just, and then, then again, we're looking the at the results. Run though, yeah, it, yeah, so. and then we're looking at results elsewhere. Uh, Army again. I think if Evan, um, I mean, this is a all sorts of if buts and maybes, but like, I think if Evan come away with the same or more points from 
these next three games than they get deducted from the second case if they were to get deducted uh, then I think they're fine for the season yeah yeah chance of our first uh, double isn't it in the in the post-covid era twice Tomorrow, isn't it yeah, yeah Bournemouth Bournemouth, then Newcastle yeah, yeah, well yeah. And then Burnley we've got three chances to do now yeah you? yeah yeah three in a week sorry Joe you're getting critiqued here by the Everton fan <laughs> advisory oh, yeah, board oh, no. says, sounded more like Roy Kent than Sean Dyche um, <laughs> wow after all the nice things I said at the start I know yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Joe, Joe has clarified apparently apparently it wasn't, that wasn't, it, it wasn't there, was a, there, was a, there was a frog in my throat <laughs> yeah. uh, somebody somebody that has to stare into uh, Sean Dyche's eyes from close proximity at least twice every week and well I mean it's going to be we did it yesterday be doing it after Bournemouth yeah be doing it after Newcastle you've had a few be weeks apart though haven't you you've had a few weeks so, apart making up for so last time so we're at five uh, I, don't, I don't think I dare try and impersonate him <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, m- m- moving on. Just um, <laughs> a, 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 a slight deviation, Joe. I mean, you mentioned obviously uh, he probably wouldn't have been in the, in, in the starting lineup, but I mean, it's obviously a, a blow. Young Lewis Dobbin there. Um, obviously, maybe not as bad as as they feared, but uh, has picked up an injury. Yeah, it sounds. I mean, you know, asked Deitch about this mm. uh, in, the, in the embargo section of the press. I mean, for those who, yeah. who don't know how it works, we have the first section of the press conference where everyone can watch. That's when the broadcast people ask questions, and obviously he gave an initial answer in relation to, to injuries there. Um, you know, in the closed section, which is when myself and the print journals get to ask questions. Yeah. I just asked him about Lewis Dobbin because w- was wasn't sure if something had happened with him. Mm. Uh, so I just wanted to get clarity, and it turns yeah. out something else. You know after Portugal but before the international break just before the players had a uh, the players who were on international duty had a break it looks like training at Finch Farm he landed awkwardly and damaged his ankle ligaments I don't know how serious that didn't go that into that much detail to me um, he said that initially they feared they might need he might need surgery and he doesn't so that's obviously a good sign uh, but it's clear that he's going to miss games so yeah. um, now look Lewis Dobbin hasn't I mean, he's having a breakthrough season because he's 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 involved in the first yeah. team squad. I mean, he scored that that goal. He had that wonderful moment against against Chelsea. Yeah. Um, so you, obviously, you don't think he'd be starting games. No. So you know, he's he's a bit part player, but he's still an important player to have in and around the squad. And he's still been a positive impact on that dressing room and on that you know yeah, on that squad during the course of the season. So it's with a, such a small squad, it, it's a worry. And I think what it does is because again the. The other thing that we learned from Finch Farm on Thursday is that Arno Danjuma, whilst he's that was his first yesterday, he took part in some proper drills for the first okay. time uh, with, with, with the squad. Deitch said, um, you know, some pictures of him from I think Tuesday engaging with the, the first yeah. team squad at Finch Farm. That sounds like he made another step forward on Thursday morning. But it still seems that he's probably a little bit away off. Obviously, we go through that whole thing of the spit and then there's Deitch fit. Yeah. So it's probably we're probably not looking at this week for for Dan Jume, or certainly not this game and and, and Newcastle. I think what it does is it just and this I think is something that was very very clear to us coming into the, the three week break is how reliant we are on Dwight McNeil and Jack Harrison. And I think by the end of that run of fixtures, I think they looked absolutely exhausted, which I think is understandable. They're two players that yeah. started this season with some of the worst injuries that they'd ever had in their careers yeah. and to come over that and then embarked on a campaign where they just didn't really have much backup. They had Dan yeah. Juma, which, like we spoke on before, I think yeah. we were all a bit concerned as to why Deitch didn't use him more from the bench in the first half of the yeah. season. Um, and obviously, you know, his availability, his greater use of him could have protected them a little bit. But these are two players that are asked to do a lot of work by Sean Deitch and do it for the full 90 plus whatever stoppage time. Yeah. So we've got to hope that the three weeks has given them a little bit of, a, of an injection of... Um, you're a bit, of, you're a bit of an opportunity to recharge their batteries because yeah, yeah. we, you know, Everton are going to be so, so, so reliant on them over the coming weeks. So, and yeah. they would have been anyway, but even more so because, as I say, Dobbin isn't going to be an option, yeah, and, and Dan Juma. I throw for, James Garner yeah. into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a chance to reset, Gav. I mean, got a comment here from Simon yeah. C on uh, on the YouTube. Uh, he said, "Tomorrow's game's winnable if we are set up to win. Unfortunately, we are set up not to concede and to nick a goal from set pieces, which falls apart when we concede the goal." Um, do you imagine? 
it's a chance to reset. Do you imagine there's going to be Sean Dyche doesn't tend to make too many surprise changes, but I mean, where would you possibly see uh, any changes? I mean, right backers have got to be a discussion, hasn't it? Seamus Coleman played uh, both full games for Republic of Ireland uh, this this past week. Um, maybe a, a, a decision over centre forward as well, whether he retains better or goes back to Calvert Lewin. But I can't imagine there'd be too many areas of the pitch who's going to make any radical switches. Got no options, have we? Really? I mean, let's face it. Um, not you know. Even the people off the bench were losing those options. No Dan Zuma now, no no Dobbin. Yeah. Um, so I think th- th- there's very few things he can do ra- other than change the centre forward and change the right back. <laughs> to be fair, you could argue there's a little bit he could do. Would you the change the right back? No, I don't know. I, 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 I think if Coleman's first, I'd always play Coleman yeah. at this stage of the season. I think uh, I think he's vital. I was quite. Uh, there's two ways of looking at it. That that I was uh, that republic republic thing wasn't it really? Played two ninety minutes. I've so not has played. He got a third in him. Yeah, yeah. Has he got a third in <laughs> him? Yeah. yeah. Um, or the other thing is looking at it is he's got a lot. You know, he's got some fitness. Yeah. B- before playing for us, uh, so I, if if he can get on the pitch, I would play him. I think we need him as captain and leader, as you would say. So that would be my. My my, my 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 selection. I'd probably Cavalin's got a decent record against Bournemouth. I'd, I'd probably look at maybe changing changing yeah. the striker. Um, I, but I, th- I think the the key thing the key thing in all of this, and it goes back to the original question about setting up to win and all all that, is we've got to be creative. To be creative, you've got to have McNeil and Harrison firing mm. yeah. on all cylinders like they were before before Christmas. And I think that's the key thing for me. And so what we're saying is here is. Hopefully the break has done them well. I mean, I think Garner was Garner's probably played more minutes than anybody. But Tarkovsky, I would imagine, uh, he he looked another one who looked yeah. who, who looked in need of a break. If we get them all back, all fresh, all fit, then I think we will hopefully see a little bit more of a positive approach than what we saw before the the th- three week uh, absence, and then just just take it from there. I mean, let's face it, it's winnable. Yeah. If you're, you were playing Bournemouth with three, was it three and a half? Looting half time, was it, or mm. there or thereabouts? Yeah. You know, they obviously can, can, can see a goal, so it's a winnable game. It's, yeah. not, it's not, maybe not like going to Old Trafford, even no, the other no, week. No. It's, it's a different game, and it's something we can get, get something from, notwithstanding our absolutely dreadful record there. But I think um, we can definitely win, yeah. and, and I think hopefully Dice can take advantage of the three week break to put out a more yeah. positive approach <laughs> rather than just basically what it was before, before the break, where it was just, just try and stay in the game and hope for the best. Yeah, Joe, um, Eugene McGeever says, I think Everton need to play Nathan Patterson against Bournemouth away tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. I'm, I mean, it's an option. We, he could throw a curveball. I mean, what what do you think um, might happen in terms of, of, of changes? Do you see that right-back one as one yeah, up for grabs? There's three areas, isn't yeah. there? I think right-back, centre midfield and up front. Yeah. Uh, right-back, I think he has to make a change. Um, ben Goffrey did a good job when he came in at right-back against Fulham. I mean, yeah, Everton's side that was really stretched. Um, obviously, you know, since then he's he's had more of a run in the team, and obviously played the last three games. Uh, you know, probably more than that at right back actually. He's played the last, uh, he's six, played the last, last yeah, six. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and but the last three games, unfortunately, yeah. You know, goals have been conceded. You know, from that area. Now look, it's not all Ben Godfrey's fault. No. Because obviously a lot of those goals, there are plenty of opportunities to prevent them for, before they even get to a situation where Godfrey's the last line. But I think that it's an area where there's a potential to improve on um, given what's happened in the last few games uh, I think you know, just by virtue of having a specialist right back for a start would yeah. be would be would be a help so you know Coleman if he's if he's got the fit if he's got the fit mm-hmm. is, is a no-brainer for me I like Patterson I think Patterson I think Patterson's raw um, but I think he's also had spells during his time at Everton where he's had a run in the team so yes he can do a job at right back most notably the start of last season where he played really well in a quite a few games and all the way up to the derby where they kept a clean sheet and he was very good in yeah. but then he got injured and you know that's been a recurring theme of when he has had chances and taken them injuries got in the way um, I was disappointed not to see Patterson come on in the second half against Manchester United you know when Evan were 2-0 down um, it felt like um, a more attacking option at right back was just a, an easy thing just to try when you've got nothing to lose and obviously it's quite telling that he didn't do that um, I don't think he'll start Patterson tomorrow and I almost also kind of think the way in which things unfolded you know, on Portugal 
that there's a stubbornness to Dyche, which might mean that even if he was minded to play him, he might actually go, <laughs> I don't want to start him because then people will it's all say it's a reaction yeah, to that absolutely. and it becomes a story. Yeah. And I'd, I'd have a degree of sympathy for that approach. Um, but it's Coleman for me, first choice, Bobby Patterson. Second Shane, choice. as they had like, the short hand for saying, there's a little bit of admission of guilt from Dyche. <laughs> if, yeah. if you play Patterson, people could perceive that, like we're actually just being selected and wouldn't he, I yeah, suppose, the, um, the optics around I'd go back to Dominic Calvert. I would, yeah. I just think he's, I think, I, I, I think Dominic Calvert is a very good Premier League striker. Uh, I hope soon, you know, I hope that he finds the form yeah. that was missing, uh, that's missed for 2024 so far. I have every faith that he will do. Yeah. I think tomorrow's a good opponent for him to try and, and hit the back of the net. Um, and then the other option is is the midfield because obviously mm-hmm. they play with the three and there's, there's four available for the first time in a while. So obviously I think Decore starts in that kind of chaos role um, between <laughs> yeah. midfield yeah. and attack, doesn't he? And then it's a case of any two from Anana, Adrissa Gay, yeah. and, and James Garner. And you look at what Deitch has done previously. You suggest perhaps that Onana might be the most likely to Did drop well out for of Belgium three. in the week. Um, but I, you know, I, yeah. I, I, as we've covered a lot on this podcast, I'm a big admirer of Onana. Yeah. Um, I just said he did well for Belgium yeah, in the week. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 might have flawed you. From, <laughs> ran out of approval from from, from, from Chris. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I probably start. I'd maybe start Garner and uh, yeah. and Anana in behind Decore. So, yeah. but that, I mean that's a bit more open to, to. But I think this is very much the perfect. I think this is maybe not the perfect, but it's certainly a very good game for yeah. him to come back to away from home against a beatable side. Um, the Dyche has a good record against. Yeah. Um, maybe further away than we'd have liked, but yeah, you know, on the bank holiday weekend. On the bank holiday weekend, yeah, but yeah. I think it's far more favourable than say, for instance, if they haven't been at Newcastle first and then gone to Bournemouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and albeit as I say, very good. Ch- you got a chance of getting something at Newcastle, but you go there and you, you there's a Evan could play to their best of their very ability and still lose yeah. against Newcastle because of the talent they've got in yeah. that side and you know the way the house got them when they're on song, which they haven't been recently, but. You know, to have the, the the easier fixture first, I think is 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 helpful. So. Yeah. Well, well, saying that, it's, pre- it's, it's come to predictions time. Now, I've already given a prediction this week because uh, the the Bournemouth media um, people got in touch w- w- with me. Yeah. Obviously, Joe wasn't available, so they turned to me and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, I stuck my neck out and I said, you know, it's Everton are due a win. They're certainly due a win at Bournemouth. And uh, I've gone for a, a repeat of that that's, um, game on 28th of May. Hopefully it's not quite as tense as that one, but uh, 1-0 Everton. Uh, Gav? I'll go with 1-0 Everton. Yeah. I, 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 I'm positive hat on. I just think the three-week break will reinvigorate yeah. us and, and they'll, they'll come back fresher I think Decore is another player who probably I would, I'd like to think he's been working really hard yeah. in, in the three week play to get some fitness up because he just doesn't look fit has he uh, and I think I think 1-0 will be an uh, eminently achievable results uh, so we don't go to our record 12 games without mm. winning in the Premier League and that sets us up well then doesn't yeah. it you're looking at a completely different block of three games if we get a win yeah, tomorrow aren't you and uh, I think we can easily do that. And they've got not much to play with. They've got seven points in the last three games, which is sort of means they'll still stay up, I think. And 1-0 to Everton. There you go. Yeah. Joe? 2-0 to Everton. Wow, he's yeah. upping yeah. the stakes. I think, I think Dyke should do a job, I think, on, yeah. on them. I think, like Gav says, yes, sir, I think it'll, it'll just reset the tone for you know, what is quite a, a significant week. Um, yeah. Let's hope I don't so. think it's panic stations if they lose, but they could really they had it's another it's another game and there are opportunities for the, the the final run of fixtures where Ever can take take control of thing take matters yeah. into their own control. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, and I think that this is a really big opportunity. Um, Going so. back back to the order of the fixtures, the one game you wouldn't want to be in your home tomorrow, would you? It would have been the, yeah. the worst of the three. So I well, think there the go. I've got another week to wait for that the one. Way for it's out, yeah, I think the yeah. fixtures have panned out for us has been has been uh, worked in our favour, hopefully. Yeah, well, um, enjoy the rest of the Easter weekend, everyone, whether you're travelling down to, to Bournemouth or not. We'll be back with you on, on Easter uh, Monday to um, reflect on Bournemouth and to look forward to the, the trip at Newcastle United off the um, opposite ends of the uh, country. Don't, uh, don't forget to, to like and subscribe for us. And uh, I've been your host, Chris Beasley. I've been joined by Joe Thomas and Gavin Buckland. This has been the Royal Blue Podcast.